What if I like to talk? <laughs> you want to talk? You're listening to Black Fawn Distro's Takeover Tuesday. The official podcast of Black Fawn Distribution. Broadcasting live across the planet and retransmitted on all major streaming platforms. Tonight's program is brought to you in part by Wellies and Breweries, Hellas Lager, Deadly Grounds Coffee, Twisted Teas, and of course Canada's number one genre film company, Black Fawn Distribution. You wanted the best. Well, they didn't make it. So here's what you get. It's really not that bad. You are going to hell. Here's your host, Benner from Black Fawn Distro. All right, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Black Fawn Distro's Takeover Tuesday. I'm your host, Benner, from Black Fawn Distro, and uh, hey, listen, uh, we got a really, really cool program going on tonight, and uh, we're broadcasting live, of course, to Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube, and then retransmitting on all the major platforms for podcasts or wherever you get your cool podcasts from, uh, including Apple and Spotify. So please remember, whatever platform you're tuning in on, uh, please remember to like, follow, share, and subscribe, and uh, you know, we appreciate you listening to us and listen, tuning in for the program, uh, but also we appreciate the support, not just for us, but our incredible guests that we have on the program each and every week. So thank you very much for that. Um, welcome back to another episode. This is one, uh, I guess, our second episode of 2022. And a quick shout out to our sponsors, Wellington Breweries, Hellas Lager, Deadly Grounds Coffee, and of course, Twisted Teas. Uh, they keep us going. They've kept us going through the pandemic and uh, they've uh, contributed a lot to our company. And you can check out all of our merch at Black Von Distro, sorry, Black Von Distribution dot com uh, check out all of the merch and our movie titles that we have available in our online store there so uh we've got a great program like i mentioned and uh listen uh if you're um a fan of cinema if you're a fan of independent filmmaking if you're a fan of uh just cool stuff that goes together uh, like uh, audience participation at movie theaters or uh, retro cult classics or anything like that. Uh, you're really going to enjoy this program. Uh, we've got uh, Lee, uh, Lee DeMarbro from uh, the Mayfair uh, cinema and Mayfair, Mayfair theater, sorry, uh, from Ottawa. And uh, uh, if you've ever been to this place, it's just, it's an absolutely uh, amazing, uh, iconic, majestic theater. Um, it's uh, almost a hundred years old and uh, Lee's actually been the programming programmer there at the theater for the last 12 years as well as co-owner uh, so he's an accomplished filmmaker himself and we're going to get to all that stuff uh very very uh soon uh, but listen um you know the drill uh before we get there before we get to anything um uh we gotta do something uh you know as fun as we can make it and that's hit the news so let's hit the news and uh i'll be back right after this Okay, and we're back with another edition of the news. That's right. I've got my tie and my jacket on, and let's see here. Give these papers a shuffle. Uh, let's get into it. Um, we've got. We'll keep it short because we want to get right to Lee and talk about all things the Mayfair Cinema, uh, Mayfair Theater, uh, Mayfair Independent Filmmaking, as well as Lee's uh, own filmography of stuff that he's been done. He's done in the past as well as working on currently. So let's get to it. Our top story tonight. Guess what? It's fucking cold out. That's right. Winter is here. We've got a ton of snow. It's minus a thousand degrees outside. Um, so if you're li living in a um, uh, a tropical part of North America instead of a snowy part of North America. We all hate you. Um, so just so you know, that's our top story. Uh, but just kidding. Um, we don't really hate you. We just, we're just supremely jealous of uh, not having to uh, 
uh, of you not having to dig your cars out of snow, your walkways and all that fun stuff. Um, it's a disaster if you are living in a northern part of North America right now, uh, like we are kind of, I guess, in the southern part of Canada, which is the northern part of wherever. Um, anyway. It sucks. Moving on. Uh, just a quick uh, update. We've got our infamous horrors contest going on right now. Uh, if you haven't actually entered the contest, we've got a massive prize pack available um, through them. Uh, we're partnering up with infamous horror who are a, uh, um, they are basically a horror community operating out of Montreal, Quebec. And uh, what you can do is you can check out their post on their Facebook and uh, I'm just going to throw it up on the screen here. So uh, you can check it out, but uh, we're sponsoring uh, this package uh, in, in conjunction with them, which is a grand prize. Uh, tons of Blu-rays, uh, DVDs. Uh, you've got the uh, Black Font Distro Toque that I'm wearing uh, tonight uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, everything that uh, all the snow and stuff that that and uh, that sort of stuff that we've got going on. So listen, if you need a toque, uh, make sure you uh, um, make sure you order one or enter this contest and you can win. This, along with coffee, a Black Fawn trucker hat, a bunch of DVDs and Blu-rays. And uh, of course, how do you enter it? Go to their Facebook page, like and comment on the post, subscribe to the Infamous Horror YouTube channel, subscribe to the Black Fawn Distro YouTube channel, and then share this post. Uh, share the post that's on there, and you'll be entered in to win uh, this amazing prize pack. And of course, you have to do it, and you have to enter before January 31st, 2022. So you got a couple more weeks. Make sure you check them out. Infamous Horror, uh, thank you so much for, uh, you know, working with us and uh, bringing this kind of contest to the masses. Lots of people stay in a home right now. And uh, you know, that's uh, unfortunate, but again, there's lots of stuff online that you can support and you can do so. And this is one of them. So check out the toque. That's right. It's winter. It's cold. I got to wear it even in the house. That's how cold it is in Canada. Now, uh, moving on. Um, we've got, uh, like I said, we've got Lee. He's in the green room. I think he's giving me the thumbs up. If you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. He's got, he's ready to go. Uh, but listen, we've got a couple more news items just to go through. Uh, and of course we like to do a physical media, um, uh, little review right now. And this week, uh, for kind of an obvious tie-in, uh, we are doing the Underworld set. Um, this is a, a, a really, really cool 4K box set that just came out from Sony Home Entertainment. Um, I bought this myself. It wasn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't shipped to me, but Sony, if you're listening, uh, that's a that's a heads up for you. Uh, but really, really cool set. If you like these movies, um, this pops open like this, and you've got all the 4K movies in here. I won't take them all out, but as you can see, really, really nice packaging. Really different uh, artwork on each uh, in each disc. I haven't got through the whole collection yet, but the first movie looks absolutely amazing in 4K. And of course, we've got Lee in the studio. Uh, he knows a lot about uh, resolution and the differences between that stuff. And we're going to get to that uh, with Lee once we have him uh, in the studio here uh, on the screen for you. So Underworld, uh, the 4K collection from Sony Home Entertainment. Um, you can order it from your local um, home video store, uh, wherever sells movies. They should be able to get this in for you. Um, it was pretty decent price and really cool really cool packaging. We love this stuff as physical media collectors. Uh, it's always cool to see um, this come, this stuff kind of come out and buying it and putting it on the shelf. So Underworld, some classic, the classic battles between vampires and lichens or werewolves or whatever you want to call them. And of course, uh, it wouldn't be an, a news update. Um, it wouldn't be a complete news update, I should say, without the fried chicken sandwich report. That's right. That's where I go out and check out a fried chicken sandwich. As you can see right here in the top of your screen, that's me eating a fried chicken sandwich from last week. Um, fried chicken sandwich report. I go out and eat a fried chicken sandwich and then tell you how good it is. And this week we went to uh, all the way to Toronto, which is about an hour um, from where the studio is located. And we checked out Knockout Chicken. Um, they've got a great high, high, high end uh, Instagram. They, they talk a big game on Instagram. Huge sandwiches, awesome platters, wicked, wicked photos on there. It got, you know, very, very tantalizing Instagram. So we went all the way to Toronto, check out knockout chicken on a Tuesday night. Um, and we got this, this is the picture of me eating it. I got the club fighter chicken sandwich and you know, it was pretty good. Um, but again, we rate it based on size. We rate it based on uh, price or value and we rate it on taste. And I got to say like a little, a little, I don't know, not enough, not enough steak for me, almost too much sizzle. I think I got overexcited from the Instagram. So uh, I don't want to knock them down too much, no pun intended, but uh, they got some good things going for them. They got this wicked thing on the, on the, on the wall, which is uh, a crispy gym and flavor for flow flavorful Floyd, which are, uh, you know, obviously two cartoon chickens boxing it out, duking it out, knockout chicken Kings of the ring, as it says. Uh, but, uh, listen, when I tried the sandwich, it was, it was okay. It was pretty good, but I was expecting a little bit more. Uh, it's kind of expensive. And, uh, also, um, 
you know, the taste was really great, had jalapenos on it. So that was a nice kick, obviously something a little bit different, uh, but no cheese. Um, so I was a little, you know, a little disappointed in that, but overall a decent sandwich. I'm giving it a three and a half out of five. We only rate stuff on this show, uh, out of the, using the star, the film rating st- five star system, no tens or seven and a half or anything like that. It's one out of five. You can use half stars. I'm using one today, three and a half out of five knockout chicken in Toronto. But listen, they do. I should say this. There is a caveat to this. They have a kick-ass platter. There's this amazing platter that they have. They, they, they talk about it all over their Instagram and it's got like fried chicken and chicken wings and sandwiches and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, I think it's like 36 bucks or something. So I, my recommendation is if you go to knockout chicken, get that platter, I, that's what I should have done. And, uh, I was disappointed in myself for not getting it as well, but listen, fried chicken sandwich. That's the report. Let's go to the standings. We've got still in number one, we've got Coco's chicken and we've got that tied with tall tree. Sandwich Co. operating out of Hamilton uh, for their fried chicken sandwiches. Both those chicken sandwiches are tied. And then we've got Zinger Chick with the bronze medal still uh, at four out of five. Everything else is a three and a half or lower, uh, as you can see. And uh, I think the uh, A&W um, chicken, chicken burger uh, got dropped off the list this week. So uh, they were in 10 last week. They're gone. So listen, if you've got a, a suggestion for a chicken sandwich uh, place to check out, make sure you drop us a line and uh, let us know. Um, you know, where we can, where we can check it out. We'll, we'll try and get there. Uh, as long as it's not a thousand miles away, we will try and get to this chicken sandwich place and give it a bite, uh, so to speak. And then we'll report back to all of our viewers to let you know how good it is. Now, moving on, uh, let's talk about our guest tonight. Um, I am so pumped to have this gentleman on the program tonight. Uh, it's a uh, lead to Marva from uh, the Mayfair Theatre. He's also an independent filmmaker, an award-winning independent filmmaker operating out of our nation's capital of Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. So Lee's been in the film business for over two decades now. uh, And in addition to his filmmaking accomplishments, he's also the co-owner and the programmer of the iconic Mayfair Theatre, which if you haven't gone to at all, if you're near Ottawa, you need to go check this place out make sure you add it to your bucket list. It's an almost century old movie theater uh, located in Ottawa as well. And uh, they've got a whole bunch of programming and really cool uh, events that they host. And we're going to get into that all with Lee in just a second. Uh, But Lee's uh, short film, uh, Harry Knuckles and the Treasure of the Aztec Mummy, I have to read that title. Uh, Awesome. Uh, Was the first Canadian film to take home the coveted Spirit of Slamdance Award at the Slamdance Film Festival. Um, He's gone on to direct seven feature films, including the cult classic uh, Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter, the horror comedy Smash Cut, as well as the starring the legendary David Hess and Sasha Gray, I should mention, as well as the wrestling documentary entry vampiro angel devil hero uh lee is in, currently in the process of completing his eighth feature which we'll also get to talking about a little bit later on so let's take a quick peek at a couple of trailers just so you know what this guy's body of work looks like and it'll help you kind of get into the groove of uh you know what you think uh if you think of some questions and if you got some questions make sure you leave them down in the comments section below uh, because we'll get to them uh, live on the air and we'll try and throw them up as we go and we'll get some answers from lee about uh, uh some of these these movies as well as uh uh, other stuff he does at the Mayfair and the other stuff, the, the new stuff, sorry, that he's working on currently. So let's take a couple of uh, seconds or a couple of minutes, sorry, to look at a couple of trailers. And uh, look, we've got uh, indie filmmaking master and super cool pro cinema programmer, Lee DeMarva, live on the other side. And we're going to get to him right after this. In the new millennium, Vampires no longer fear the sun. Now they're going to learn. It's time to fear the Son of God! Caracas is Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to show you the coming attraction for a motion picture called Smash Cut. 
Allow me to introduce Abel Whitman. Action! That guy makes Ed Wood look like Orson Welles. Oh my God. It's so fake. Abel, my boy, don't let the reviews get you down. What are you? The good? The bad? No, the ugly. I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> and then I'm gonna cut up your body into little pieces and use them in my movie. Action! He's going to kill everyone! April Carson, WKY TV. Tell me you're here to audition. Yeah, totally. Here, use this. What's that smell? It's just a prop. It's only a prop. Cut! That's a print. You're young. You're perky. You're better every day, April. But today, you're acting as if your life depended on it. You should be in front of the camera more. <laughs> For those of you who appreciate this type of cinematic art, you will see the most startling scenes of their type ever filmed. I'm taking the script out of your hands, Alan! But for those of you with heart conditions, or who are with young and impressionable children, we ask that you turn around in your seat, or leave the auditorium immediately. It's gonna be a bitch for a uh, makeup department. It's cut check time. Art is worth suffering. I've always said you have really good eye on We really have to show the people what filmmaking is all about. What real filmmaking, what the art of filmmaking is all about. We've got to snap them out of their complacency. We've got to show them the suffering and the hurt and the pain that goes into filmmaking. I implore you, ladies and gentlemen, to never forget that filmmaking is a blood sport. Watch if you must, but remember, you were warned. Who's putting this on again? Whitman. Abel Whitman. Jesus, I hope he makes a movie someday. You'll be immortalized in Abel Whitman's next film, whether you like it or not. All right, and we're back. And that was a look at a couple of awesome uh, trailers uh, from uh, my friend and uh, I guess friend friend of the company, friend of the show. This is the first time you've been on, but uh, Lee DeMarb, uh, welcome, sir. How are you? Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. I tried to fix my lighting situation and I put in my new toupee on. So I dressed up just for you. <laughs> uh, well, we appreciate it. And of course we're broadcasting live to Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, but of course we rebroadcast or we, we, we retransmit on uh, all the major streaming platforms uh, for podcasts. Um, so cool. including Apple and Spotify. So don't worry. Uh, our retransmission is going to go out just audio only. So you don't have to worry about uh, oh. any of the lighting, but I think it looks cool, man. I think you have this classic movie thing going on in your, uh, wherever you are right now in the background, uh, which is really cool because um, you are the guy I know. And I would classify as, the classic cinema dude that knows everything about that old school shit. I bet. Well, I'm, I'm passionate about it. You know, <laughs> all, you always meet someone who knows more about movies than you do, but sometimes I think, you know, but I'd like to think I love movies just about as anyone, you know, as more than anyone else, not anyone else, but I like I, I love it more than I know about it. You know, I'm not one of those guys who has a photographic memory, uh, but I certainly love cinema. The good well, and the bad. Well, I know uh, we met you uh, a few years back, I guess. Well, I must have been, I want to say probably about six, seven years ago. Uh, and we screened uh, one of our releases, Disco Path at the Mayfair. Wonderful. Uh, and it was uh, you, you had called us or emailed us, I think, and told us how much you love the film. And uh, we were able to make it happen. And it was, it was awesome. And uh, just to give people just a quick kind of, uh, um, uh, just just a heads up as to what this place looks like and we're going to get it get into it in, in, a, in a few minutes for sure but i'm just going to throw this up on the screen which is this is the this is a picture of of the inside of the mayfair it's it's an absolute classic looking uh cinema movie theater whatever you want to call it uh, it was an absolute treat to to watch our film uh screen there and and since then we've seen i'll take your dead has been there i think better the dead played there as well um but uh it's just a fabulous a fabulous place um to check out films and of course you know, um, with the pandemic and all that stuff, everyone's sick and tired of talking about it, but, uh, you know, you guys are closed right now, but you know, we're going to get into getting, talking about what you have coming up when you, when you do reopen. Uh, like I said, I tell everyone who has ever goes to Ottawa, I say, make sure you go to the Mayfair. It's an awesome place to check out a film. And it's, it's an experience like that you don't get, 
uh, or you wouldn't get at you know any of the bigger cinemas. So, uh, but listen, I want to before we get into that, I want to jump into um, uh, talking about you're an independent filmmaker as well. Uh, and at the top, I said, you know, you've been in the game for over 20 years now. Uh, you've got a whole host of projects that you've completed, that you're working on, that you've done. What kind of, how did you get into that originally? Because I actually don't know that. And what got, what draws you to the, the different style of projects um, or what, what has drawn you to the different styles of projects over the years? I'll try to tell the story short. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's a long one. And I been I tell this story to my friends. I don't know if I've told it in full detail to uh, to anyone who's been recording me saying this. But I remember, you know, I, I grew up, um, I moved to Ottawa in 1977 when I was five. And for the first five years of my life, I lived in a city in Ontario that didn't have a cinema. So I moved to Ottawa the year Star Wars came out. And that was a big deal for me. And I and that was it was a movie that I loved so much. My mother kept taking me to see Star Wars over and over again in the theater. And then Jaws two, I remember being the next big one. Not Jaws, but Jaws two, I was thrilled by as a kid. And then my mother just started taking me to see movies almost every weekend, usually Sunday night before you know, maybe around seven we go see a movie and I go to bed and get up and go to school on a Monday. And that lasted from you know almost a decade. Until I, I remember moving to Newfoundland and coming back to Ottawa in '86, and my mother took me to see everything theatrically, and and I, I still can't believe the kind of stuff I saw theatrically. A movie like Time Bandits, the Terry Gilliam's Time Bandits, I saw when it came out opening weekend, and was thrilled by it. Rambo, the the sequel to First Blood. Night of the Comet was a big one for me. I remember being young and seeing this zombie movie on the big screen. And uh, I was thought my mom was so cool to take me to see something like that. Some movies I was afraid to go see. I didn't want to go see stuff. I thought that the ads in the paper for the stuff looked too terrifying. I remember I used to love looking through ads in newspapers, the Fright Night, the original Fright Night. Anyway, why? Well, how did I become a filmmaker? I'm telling you this because uh, my mother, uh, you know, saw that I loved seeing movies on the big screen and, and, and thought maybe. And, and I realized I. I can't remember how old I was, but that, that filmmaking was an art form and that may be something that, that I could pursue. And so when I moved to Ottawa from Newfoundland in 86, I wanted a video camera. But video cameras, you know, were expensive. I wanted to spend about uh, $1,000 on a video camera. And, and as a 14-year-old kid, $1,000 was a lot of money. And I went to work at a Chinese restaurant here in Ottawa run by the Italian mob. Okay. <laughs> and I remember, I remember it was a crazy place. We ran prostitutes out of the kitchen on the weekends and I was 14 and there'd be, there was a machete fight in our, in our kitchen once and Mr. Moon cut off Mr. Hum's fingers and they, and they wanted me to replace him. But shortly they found out my dad was a, my dad was a cop. So they moved me to a different location. <laughs> it was just like it was less crime. <laughs> And I remember as soon as I afforded that video camera, I quit. I needed to get away from prostitution and, and, and knife fights. And uh, I remember being young, and, and I was the only kid in my high school who had a video camera. And I wasn't a particularly good reader. I wasn't a bookworm. I had a hard time with the English language on print. It took me a while. It actually was foreign cinema. Going to see subtitled movies in the theater made me, for the first time in my life, concentrate on the words I was reading. I had a hard time reading books. And um, so I always asked my teachers if I could do a video instead of a, you know, an essay. And, and a, a part of that was being doing it as a presentation in class. And the teachers loved it. And I loved presenting my videos. And I would help other students with projects. And, you know, video, I eventually would uh, go to work uh, and do live camera, at, you know, it, through co op. I did a lot of live camera on. on and, and I would film hockey events or, you know, sporting events, um, political events, and learn framing. And I loved impressing my directors and did live camera. I was good at live Zooms. <laughs> That's really nerve-wracking to do a Zoom on a live televised event and then and and, and the, hear the director oh yeah lee oh yeah oh yeah that's so good it thrilled me <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you agreed to do this show because we go live every other tuesday right it's, it's nerve-wracking but it brings out a nice energy too and so 
uh, I went and, and but I didn't realize, you know, I transferred. I recently transferred all the films I made in high school because I would do videos on the weekends with my friends. We call it basement wardrobe because we usually shot it in someone's basement and we would raid our parents wardrobe and we would make these short films. And I, I, I digitized 88 short films that I made. Uh, in high school with my friends, like serious things that we edited, we would edit in camera. So you would film, and if you didn't like a take, you would rewind and tape over what you just shot because, it, you know, you couldn't, I didn't have a way of editing until I got a camcorder with flying erase ads, and I can, I could do that later on. But you would lose generations. I, want, I wanted to keep the quality up. It was crazy how we made movies back then. But when I was at went to university, I realized there's there's difference from 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 seeing what I'm seeing in the theater and what I was doing at home. What was that difference? And I realized, oh, it's because celluloid. Hollywood films are being shot on celluloid. And there was an Ottawa filmmaker by the name of Frank Cole uh, who made these incredible films in Ottawa. He's one of Canada's best filmmakers. And I went to see his retrospect at the arts court here in Ottawa. And I saw all those films on 16 millimeter. And I kept looking at the projection booth, the little window and seeing the film going to the projector. I'm like, that's it. If I want to take myself seriously as a filmmaker, I have to learn how to, to, to shoot on film. And, and Frank Cole was that who inspired me. So I joined IFCO and, um, and, and learned 16 millimeter Bullocks and Jesus Christ Vampire and the Harry Knuckles movies were shot entirely. I had the camera in the other room. I wish I brought it out. I shot it on a, you know, uh, on a, I'm gonna, I had this Werner Herzog a Blu ray uh, box <laughs> here. It's about this big. The camera was about this big, and it was a wind up camera. It was no batteries, and then nothing plugged in. And we shot, I shot two feature length films on a camera like that. And because the, the you know, the camera was loud. And so I couldn't record sync sound. So we post dubbed, uh, we post, uh, we, bring, we bring the actors in months later to record their dialogue. So, you know, sometimes the sync isn't perfect. It's never perfect actually in the movie, but you know, we were inspired by movies like the golden harp, the movies coming out of Hong Kong from Jackie Chan and Sama Hung that were all like that. And, and the Italian Italian movies from Sergio Leone to Jess Franco, whoever, uh, you know, they were all dubbed. Um, and, and how did I, you know, I remember my mother only took me to see Hollywood movies. And when I went to Carleton university taking film studies, you know, I remember going to Carleton first year and a film, one of the students who was in the class with me said, Lee, let's spend this whole summer watching movies. So when we get to first year film studies, no profess professors would take us seriously because we've seen these movies. And she says, what movie should I watch? And I recommended, you know, you got to watch the Godfather movies. Make sure you see those. The Laugh You Out of Class, the Casablanca. And I recommended all these like, classics. And four years, I, four years of university, we never watched one of those movies. You know, they... Because I think up until I went to university, I was always fo just focused on Hollywood. So I was introduced to foreign cinema and national Canadian cinema. And that just blew my mind. Um, and, and and so I was, by the time I was ready to make my own, my first film on, on 16 millimeter, um, you know, what to make first, I realized that all these genres and, and national cinemas that were in my head sort of came out of Harry Knuckles. Harry Knuckles isn't one thing. It's my love of many things of cinema. It's a kung fu action comedy horror musical, you know? Uh, that's what all those movies are. <laughs> so it's got so much, there's so much in there. You know, it being inspired by, you know, you know, the trash cinema of John Waters. Oh, uh, it, from John Waters to Woody Allen to Monty Python, you know, to Jackie Chan and Sammo Hung. Like, my inspiration is just all over the place. And I think the films maybe reflect a little bit of that. So you go, so was Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter your first feature? That's right. Right. Okay. I made a film called The Hacker in high school, which is on YouTube. And I shot it on VHS and it's about 45 minutes long. And, you know, I remember, you know how I used to distribute my movies? So I worked at a video store and I like telling the story. And I don't remember, remember VHS tapes. Uh, I don't even know if you're old enough, but VHS tapes had a tab. Oh, yeah. And if you broke the tab off the tape, you couldn't tape over. So all these new movies are coming out on, on, on VHS with the tab broken. And I wanted to distribute my short film so I can tell my friends at school to go see my film. So I used to put tape on the tab. I used to work at West yep. Coast. Put yeah, the yeah. tape on the tab, and I'd put my short films. I'd dub my short films after feature-length films. So if I, you know, I would tell my friends at school, 
if you want to see my new movie, watch Lethal Weapon 2. Fast forward after the credits and you'll see my new movie. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got my films out there. And that was a fun way to do it. And then when we made The Hacker, uh, we had VHS tapes made and I got them distributed in Ottawa on VHS to a few video stores, which was cool. But Jesus Christ Vampire, yeah, that's my first feature length film shot in Tyler and 60 entirely on 16 millimeter took two years to shoot because we were only shooting on weekends with friends. And, uh, that was the time of my life. We make movies like that. That, that was, that was a thrill and it got out there in a big way. It's funny. It's funny thinking back on, I thought it would just, I thought, I thought the film would never leave Canada. I thought I'd show it in here in Ottawa, maybe Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Victoria, maybe somewhere in the, the prairies, uh, sorry, the Maritimes and it'd be done. But then this little movie played at the Bytown Cinema here in Ottawa called Six String Samurai, which is an American independent kung fu movie, which uh, Jeffrey Falcons in that movie, who I really liked as a martial artist. He went to Hong Kong and made some cool movies. And he made this, and the poster was at the Bytown. And on the poster, it said, um, select, you know, official selection of the Slam Dance Film Festival. I'm like, Slam Dance? Never heard of Slam Dance before. That must be like Sundance, and found out that Slam Dance takes place in the same city at the same time as Sundance across the street. So uh, the, the filmmakers, the, everyone at Slamdance were filmmakers, American filmmakers who were frustrated. They couldn't get their films into Sundance. They felt that Sundance had become too commercial. And so here they were making their own festival. And it was cool. I was like, oh, I'll submit, I'll submit Harry Knuckles. And we got in. And we won. And then the next year we went with, with Jesus Christ Vampire. And what a thrill to go to Park City. And, you know, there's Roger Ebert. <laughs> Come to see our movie. You know, it was fun doing that kind of stuff and pimping our films and being around American independent filmmakers because American film independent filmmakers are really inspiring, I find. I find Canadian filmmakers, they just, they won't make their movie unless they get their grant. I'm going to apply for a grant. If I get rejected, I'm not going to make my movie. But American filmmakers spend their own money. They max out their credit cards and max out their parents' credit cards. They get their movie made by any means necessary. And I love that spirit. It's a, that and wild a lot west. Of it's, like, I love it. it's sort of like that wild west uh, spirit. And and uh, I know exactly. I know exactly what you mean. Like I mean, just being uh, obviously our sister company, Black Fawn Films, is the production wing of uh, of of our enterprises. And I know, you know, even talking to Chad and Cody and and uh, the guys over there is just like you know, uh, it, it's not necessarily that the grants are 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 not. Um, it's not like they're not a good idea. Of course they are. Um, they help out a lot of people for sure. But we just feel like sometimes we're on the timeline where the grant application process sometimes doesn't line up with, you know, what those guys can do in a specified yeah. uh, bit of time. Right. Where it's like, you know, if you had to wait for grants, you'd be waiting forever to kind of make, make your movie. So uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that it sounds like it's been like that kind of for a while and in the States being, you know, that's how I know that's how Kevin Smith used to make clerks, right. He maxed out all of his credit cards and borrowed, begged and yeah. stole. And I never did make that story. movie. I didn't film it. So uh, and, and El Mariachi was made. Sorry, Robert Rodriguez and El Mariachi. You know, he made that movie for six thousand dollars with his own money. He he and David Lynch made Eraserhead by with a newspaper route. And I love hearing those stories. I think it's really inspiring. So speaking of which, by any uh, means necessary. Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter uh, is also now available, like more than tw or like more than twenty years later now, uh, is available on Tubi. So if you haven't, if you want to check out the film, you can actually go to Tubi. Uh, just you know, Google Tubi and it'll pop up. It's basically free Netflix. A lot of people in Canada don't don't know about it, but they operate in Canada, the U.S., uh, the U.K., uh, as well as New Zealand and Australia. Um, and just you just search. Uh, Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter, it'll pop up and it's the digitized version of the film that was originally shot on 16 millimeter. Right, Lee? Yeah, it's funny. I I spent, I remember finishing, when I was finishing the movie, I went to Toronto and I spent $10,000 on a sound mix. It was a lot of money at the time for me. And my own money. I didn't have a distributor, didn't have a producer. Self-finance. $10,000 on a sound mix, $12,000 on a negative cut because I shot on 16 millimeter. And to cut my negative and, and, and make the optical track and have a 60 millimeter print that we we're showing at the Bytown Cinema at the premiere, I you know I spent you know, over twenty thousand dollars that weekend. And when it came to doing a VHS transfer, I had two hundred dollars left, and I spent two hundred dollars on a lousy VHS transfer, and that's the transfer most of the world saw. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 
crummy that most people saw that lousy transfer. So now it's a, the Blu-ray came out, and I believe Tubi's showing the HD version. Thank God. And I, I hope people who, who remember seeing it will might watch it again just to see it in HD because eight, the HD version looks more like the 16 millimeter print. But I got to say, spending all that money on 16 millimeter was worth it because when we got invited to the Cannes Film Festival. And we showed it at the Cannes as the best of the Slam Dance Film Festival. We showed our movie at the, in the Palais Cinema, where they had just premiered *Crashing Tiger, Hidden Dragon*, um, and, and in you know in the mood for, in the mood for love, the Wong Kar Wai film that just premiered there. And here we are showing our movie. Most people had shot on video. We're just showing their movies on a VCR in a hotel room, where we had a print, so we got the show in the big theater. So that made it all worthwhile. But man, that two hundred dollar transfer wish never happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I know about that tab too on the on the VHS because I I also used to work at a video store. Oh. Uh, you know, just for our younger listeners out there, uh, there was this magical time where there was there was a bunch of stores everywhere where people could go and rent movies, and you wouldn't know if they were there or not. Um, but uh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that tab. That's that's hilarious though. So w- was it Lethal Weapon too? Like that's the movie you had to rent. That's the one. That's the one. I, I we did it on a few movies. But I think that must have been the first one. Because I always bring up when I tell the story, I always bring up *Lethal Weapon* too. That was, but I did the, maybe *Backdraft*. I try to put it on popular movies. I hate *Backdraft*. Hated *Backdraft* then. Still hate *Backdraft*. <laughs> I, 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 maybe we should try to put it on better films. But *Backdraft* was really popular. So you know, those are just some of the *Deceive*, the *Goldie Hawn*, uh, *Hudson Hawk*. You know, some of these movies that came out. Of, when I worked there, hook, we just throw our movies on the end. So fun. look, if anyone's listening out there and you have potentially a copy of lethal weapon Two, <laughs> lethal weapon Two, backdraft or the deceived um, on VHS, <laughs> you might have a, uh, a, a dub version of, uh, of uh, one of Lee's short films. So you should check that out and let him know or swing by the yes. fair and drop it off. I'm sure he'd love to have a copy. Um, <laughs> So let's talk about the the Mayfair and let's talk about 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter and all that fun stuff, because, you know, we talk a lot about uh, independent film and and getting projects off the go. uh, But we don't necessarily talk to a lot of people like yourself who are really in the the screening business of showing these films to to the general public. And I think there's lots of cool stuff to talk about. You've been involved with the Mayfair for the last 12 years. You're co-owner. You're also the 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 film programmer at the cinema. like talk to us about the Mayfair. Um, give us the rundown because I know all about it. I've been there, but for people that haven't gone there, um, what can they expect and why are you so passionate about, about film screening there? I believe it's the second oldest operating cinema in Canada. It opened in 1932, you know, and think about it. 1932, the sound era sound was just becoming a thing in cinema. Movies like wizard of Oz and gone with the wind even been made yet. Um, I wish the Mayfair could talk to me and and tell me stories. You know, sometimes when I put on an old movie, I brought my son during the lockdown. I brought my son in and we watched Red River, Howard Hawks' Red River. And I thought to myself, geez, Red River would have screened here when it came out. Mm-hmm. I wondered, does the, 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 the screen and the speaker say to themselves, huh, I remember this movie. <laughs> I remember playing this before. Uh, 1932, and, and, you know, I also Tom Cruise grew up in Ottawa a short while, and his first movie – he ever saw was at the Mayfair. He saw 2001 A Space Odyssey at the Mayfair and made him decide, oh, I'll make movies. Holy jumping. Isn't that cool? Chad, Chad is going to freak out. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's that's his favorite actor is Tom Cruise. Yeah, he Tom Cruise talked about it at the Oscars when Stanley Kubrick died. He introduced the Oscars and talked about growing up in Ottawa and seeing 2001 and the Space Odyssey on the big screen. And now on the red carpet afterward, he talked about how he saw it Someone asked him what theater, and he said, oh, it was the Mayflower Theater. <laughs> <laughs> the Mayflower is a restaurant on Elgin Street, but he confused it. But it was the Mayfair where he saw it. You almost got all that residual business, right, from Tom yeah. Cruise? <laughs> yeah, I got I to gotta meet. I want to convince Tom Cruise to buy the building now. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Tom, if you're listening, um, but he's a big film. He's a massive massive yeah. film nerd too like yeah. I, mean, I heard that he i heard two stories about tom cruise and uh you know just through the press but that he had a, a kick-ass theater a home theater installed like the best of the best at his home and he tries to watch a film a day um because he gets new ideas and and just the history of film and stuff and and uh you know i say what you will about tom cruise but i mean the guy makes good fucking movies right yeah um, and yeah. his filmography is pretty much flawless from front to back 
Yeah, I I'm, I feel like I'm always separating the artist from the the, the 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 man from the art. I don't care about Tom Cruise. I don't care what he believes in. I don't care what he says politically. I don't follow any of that stuff. Yeah, I, the quality of filmmaking is what I, matters to me. And yeah. and man, he tries hard to make good movies. I want to see him jump out of a building, man. That's what I care about, right? <laughs> yeah, it's really impressive. He's like a, he's like the Caucasian Jackie Chan. <laughs> So listen, Tom, uh, Mr. Cruz, if you're listening, uh, if you've got a soft spot in your heart for Ottawa still, um, please consider, yeah, maybe buying the building that the Mayfair is yeah. in. And that's the first place you saw 2001. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> so now the Mayfair as well, like you guys do a ton of audience participation screenings. I don't know if there's a particular term for them, but uh, you you always do Rocky Horror. You always screen the room. Um there's a lot of people out there that haven't gone to a screening like that. Uh, what can you tell, what, what can you tell us? Like, what's the, like, what else do you do? How do you put on the, uh, how do you put on the shows and, and what are the types of things that people can, can expect if they go to one of these, I guess I would say riots. Cause that's what they are. Right. I, mean, I often, when I'm selling tickets, I often get asked by couples. I like when older couples ask me this, you know, when are you showing Rocky or picture show next? What do we do? And I always tell the man that wear his wife's underwear to the screening and come. <laughs> <laughs> Does that happen? Like <laughs> people do that? I'd like to think. Well, I mean, we there's you know people running around in underwear all night long to Rocky Horror. I think Rocky Horror, our Rocky Horror Picture Show performance, and I've seen it in many cities around the world. Nothing beats our shadow cast. So the shadow cast comes from all over Ottawa, and I, some of the actors are from Montreal, and they perform on stage in front of the movie while the movie's on. And it's thrilling, and every night's different, and some of the actors switch up different roles, and and it's really it's a really good performance at the Mayfair. Um, they put on a good show, and they try really hard. I'm impressed with those guys. The Rocky Horror Picture Show had its world premiere in Ottawa at the Ottawa Film Expo, uh, back when a week before the film was released theatrically, um, which is kind of crazy. Ottawa was the birthplace of Rocky Horror, so we deserve the coolest screenings. Uh, we show it once a month, usually around midnight, uh, and it, that's a that's a that's a scream. We used to show it. We used to have a print, and we used to be able to show that until Disney took over at 20th Century Fox. You know that Walt Disney now owns Rocky Horror Picture Show, which is nuts. Are they, um, are they, they going to give it an amazing Blu-ray release or 4K release like they have done some of their other films? Sorry, Disney. We're not sponsored by Disney, if anyone's curious. Yeah. They might not admit the owning that movie. It's not on Disney Plus yet. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to uh, uh, jump in on a couple. Of, we got a, a pretty good audience tonight. I want to just jump onto a couple of uh, uh, um comments here um uh, we've got john mcisaac a longtime listener and viewer of the show uh this is amazing awesome john thanks for tuning in again uh and this is why we have yeah this is why we have we wanted to have lee on because like he know he's got a you're a great storyteller and b you know a lot of stuff about the real rich history of of these like the screenings the films themselves um uh, Daryl popping into a long time listener of the show blockbuster on a Friday night with something else. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, let's see. Uh, oh yeah. You know, our good friend, uh, Chris drew, uh, Jesus Christ, vampire hunter is a Canadian classic and, uh, can't watch, can't wait to rewatch it on Tubi now that he knows that it's there. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. And, and, uh, of course, you know, talking about the, you know, you were mentioning, um, you know, filming your first feature, uh, that film in particular on 60 millimeter, You've got a 35 millimeter projector at the Mayfair. Uh, and there's a lot of people out there that don't necessarily, they hear these numbers being thrown around, don't really understand necessarily the importance or the impact that those films have on that format. Can you give us sort of a Coles notes um, type rundown of, of what that means? Cause I saw you at Ottawa comic-con a few years ago and you gave this great kind of breakdown of sort of like what everything meant and why 35 millimeter was so such a great asset to still have. Yeah, I, you know, I think about that. I thought about that recently. I, Who Framed Roger Rabbit just came out on 4K Blu-ray. And all these new releases are coming out on 4K, but a lot of new release movies are shot digitally. You know, a lot of movies are being shot on 4K or, you know, everything's being shot digitally now. So 4K movie of a 4K th th film that was shot 4K digitally, I don't know, it just looks as good as it did in the theater. But a movie shot on 35 millimeter, scanned at 4K, and now 35 millimeter is still equivalent to 6K, they say. But right. consider the fact that movies have been shot on 35 millimeter since the dawn of the moving image. 
Uh, the moving image was created in 1895. And all these old movies that were shot on 35 millimeter now, can now be scanned at 4K. And I feel like old movies aren't old anymore. When I was a kid and I went to the, the video store and watched King Kong or Citizen Kane, I, did, I always felt like I was watching an old movie. You know, the quality, you know, they're in black and white. The quality wasn't rich. Sometimes you're watching scans of a 35 millimeter print. And if the projectionist decided to cut out a scene to make the movie shorter, then that's what you watch. <laughs> now, I think home video is now at a point where it's never been as good to watch a movie. And they're going in and they're restoring these films and they look better than they ever have looked before. Who framed Roger Rabbit on, on 4K Blu-ray? I was amazed how good it looked. The blacks are real. You know, like it's not a dark gray or a light gray. They're they're rich. And I was just—it looked like I had a 35 millimeter projector in my basement watching it here. Um, I don't know. I just—I I keep telling my everyone I know, old movies aren't old anymore. They're maybe you know maybe some of them are black and white, but they look like they were shot yesterday. That's my feeling too. Like I—I I got into 4K, and I—it's not like I was didn't believe in it. I was just like, I feel like Blu-ray is enough. For years, I was like, nothing's ever going to look as good as as Blu-ray, like in your home. Right. Like, I mean, yeah. the theater is still going to be the theater. They got a, a screen bigger than whatever. Right. So, um, but I was like, uh, I bought the first 4K. Uh, I bought a PS5 before we went into, before we went into lockdown last, last winter. I was like, I'm going to yeah. get a 4K screen and I'm going to get a 4K, uh, a PS5 because at least that'll give me something to do uh, throughout the winter. Um, and uh, the first movie I got was um, The Shining. Uh, mm -hmm. on 4k and i had the blu-ray and i put the blu-ray in and i go well that looks good like and i wanted to do a straight comparison and yeah. i said i don't have a problem with that picture right and then i put the 4k in and i was like blown away like it yeah. was it it a yeah it the, the color grading the the grain um and there's i don't know if you can talk to the grain uh in film because it's a bit of an odd topic a lot of people don't understand why it's there they think if grain is on the screen it's a bad thing where it's actually creates more depth of field in the yeah. in the image that you're that you're watching it makes it more of a uh, 3d image right the shining on 4k looks better than dr sleep on 4k yeah dr sleep was shot digitally and the shining was shot in 35 by stanley kubrick so it looks incredible that, that that's a good picture quality and I find that the restoration stuff, like for the older films, because it's, it's, uh, or anything that doesn't have, isn't heavy on CGI, um, because they can't, what I've read and researched is that they can't really finish the CGI at 4k because it'll take right. too long to process. So they film at 4k down, convert to 2k, finish all the CGI, then up convert to 4k again, yeah. uh, and then put it on disc. The only film it's funny too, because I went to, um, when I saw Joker in the theater, uh, that's a movie that for some reason blew me away, like from a, from a, a, a visual point of view, like, and I don't know why it just, it just looked amazing. And uh, apparently it was shot at 6.5 K digitally and that's why it looks so good. So they, uh, they basically shot it as high as digital they could to make it replicate 35 millimeter apparently. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So 4k, make sure you get that film fans out there. Make sure you get 4K. It's yeah. It's, it's like watching, and I also as well. Like I just watched Close Encounters on 4K the other night, and uh, it's like watching the film for the first time. Mm -hmm. like it's like you see so much more detail. I don't know. It sounds weird, but it's. I remember, Laserdisc had. I had that this feeling with Laserdisc. I felt like Laserdisc was this great leap, because with Laserdisc, for the first time, I was watching movies that I was in love with in widescreen. I'm, you know, I loved the James Bond movies as a kid, but they were always in pan and scan. And then you watch the James Bond movies on Laserdisc, and it's like, whoa, there's twice the image here. Because they put the black bars on the top of the bottom, you get twice the image. But, you know, but speaking of the black bars, it drives me crazy. The black bars are now used in chain cinemas to show Cinemascope movies in smaller screens. I hate that. You know, the Mayfair is a real movie theater. The Bytown Cinema is a real movie theater. These two cinemas in Ottawa where the image, when you show a Cinemascope movie, the screen gets bigger. Right. But chain cinemas are like 12 or 24 screens in one in one room, one building, and the rooms are square. And the only way you can get an image that's that wide into a square screen is putting the black bars on the top of the bottom. And I can't believe that's what black bars are used for today. It drives me nuts. Well, it's like, that's when I watched, I watched the uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League 
and it was all shot. It's all oh. cut in IMAX, which would have probably looked amazing in IMAX, but I laughed because I was like sitting on the couch and I was like, <laughs> uh, like everyone else watching it at home on, you know, whatever HBO. And it was just like, how funny is it that I'm watching like a square image now, like on a widescreen TV? Like, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, I love the IMAX stuff. I love it when the, when they pop the image open on, on certain Blu-ray releases or 4k releases, it looks really good. First uh, time I noticed that was the force awakens. Yeah. Like, and during the um, force awakens, it would open up during some scenes. Uh, a lot of the Chris Nolan movies do it and um, the, but they, I don't think they did it on Dune for some reason. So I'm interested to see, but I heard Dune 4k is like, is, is a, is one of the best releases of the year already yeah, uh, as far as, <laughs> so <laughs> um, listen, uh, I, I, we do have a, uh, it's this time of the program, Lee, I, I kind of mentioned this in passing, but we do have a rapid fire uh, section to our program uh, where we ask you, the guest, a bunch of rapid fire questions and you have to give us honest answers. Um, uh, of course, uh, are you down to do that for us right now? It sure, I, I, like Superman, I can't lie. So there'll be nothing but honest. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, this is our rapid fire section. It's brought to us by uh, Wellington Breweries, Hellas Lager. Uh, obviously, uh, they are one of our sponsors for the program and take advantage of uh, Wellington's free local delivery, or you can visit their uh, brewery retail store located here in Guelph, Ontario. They're one of the, le- the, the oldest uh, microbreweries in the country, uh, or you can pick up some cans uh, wherever your favorite adult beverages are sold. That includes the LCBO in Ottawa, at least. So if you feel like doing that, you can, uh, but Hellas Lager, Hellas, yeah. And uh, this is our rapid fire section. Lee, are you ready to go? I think so. Okay, here we go. So rapid fire, yes or no. Has anyone, you, you mentioned this too, because because you said you were the, you're the worst pronouncer of your own last name before we came on the air. Yeah. So I have a question for you. Has anyone ever referred to you as the DeMarbro man? You know, like the Marlboro man, but uh, friendlier. Uh, no, no, okay. I've not heard that one, but okay. I, I'd love to hear it. Well, uh, newsflash, you now have a new nickname. Um, okay, rapid fire, moving on. You got to pick one. Out of all the film franchises in cinema history, which franchise has the best fourth installment? And oh, we will ex- we will accept either third sequel or the fourth movie made chronologically. Uh, Friday the 13th. Okay, the final chapter, kind of. That's a quick, not really thing. I was going to say this. a good movie. Man. I was going to say thin. I like the film Thin Man series a lot, and I like them all. But yeah, I like Friday the 13th 4 just because Tom Savini came back and the gore and the machete in the head. And yeah, I, think, I feel like that. I think that's the best ending to a film, too, in yes. that, that franchise. So, yeah. yeah. OK, fair enough. Moving on. Uh, help us out uh, over your entire lifetime. What's the film that you've watched the most times? Uh, Empire of the Sun. Really? Yeah. Spielberg. Yeah, I, I came to Ottawa and I didn't have a lot of friends. I was always moving schools every five years. So, I, you know, it was hard. I was always saying hello and goodbye to friends. And when I came to Ottawa, I kept going to see that movie, that and Who Framed Roger Rabbit, over and over and over again in the theaters. I, I was in love and I would sit there with tears in my eyes. Not because I was moved by the drama. I was because I was moved by the quality of filmmaking in both films. As a young person, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit to me is probably the most complicated movie ever made in Hollywood. I would love to see a version of that movie without the animation, with all the animatronics, that were, all the wires and everything they were using to make that movie. And Empire of the Sun, yeah, that movie, I can't. I own a 35 millimeter print of both of those movies, actually. That's a, Empire <laughs> of the Sun is. I, I bet you a lot of people out there thought you were going to say Empire Strikes Back, but. Empire of the Sun, I I think it might be Spielberg's most underappreciated movie. Personally, it's my favorite. I, it's funny. I, all my, I love so many filmmakers. My favorite Steven Spielberg movie personally is Empire of the Sun. It's probably not his best film, but it's personally my... It's like The Color of Money. It's my favorite Martin Scorsese film, personally. Right. The Color of Money was a film like Empire of the Sun I kept going to see when I was young. And I was thrilled by the camera positioning and, and the... Uh, it, uh, that movie is his most visual film, I think. An amazing uh, performance by John Malkovich, and also, of course, a very, 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 very young Christian Bale. Yeah, he's my age. That's why I liked it too. I remember reading the reviews, and the re- it wasn't a well reviewed film. Uh, Last Emperor was out at the same time. The Last Emperor would go on to win Best Picture. And I think a lot of critics compared them. And the, I remember the reviews were lukewarm for Empire of the Sun, and I would read them and I would try to understand them because I was a kid. I was Christian Bale's age when it came out, and I remember them thinking that Spielberg looked like he was glorifying the war. And now, in retrospect, I realize he was t- showing you the war through a kid's 
point of view. So he to to a kid, the war was exciting. Tanks and planes were exciting, and uh, and, the, and the kids don't understand the impact. Uh, you know, uh, of the war, they just you see the the smell of the engines and and the yeah. Spitfires, and that's what he was he was he was dramatizing. A uh, Jim, that's his character name, um, J. G. Ballard's uh, as a kid, his enthusiasm for the war, and that's what I got as a kid, but I didn't know how to articulate or really even understood until I re- reread the reviews when as I got older. After my balls dropped, I reread the reviews. <laughs> I could understand why critics got it wrong at the time. I remember, uh, like, like my, so my favorite Spielberg movie is E.T., uh, hands down, because it was the very first yes. film I ever saw in the theater. And even when I watch it today, the third act of that movie, it always oh. gets me. And I don't know why. It's the music. It's the music. It's just the – anyway, the quality this is rapid quality. fire. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. But 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 uh, but uh, it's it's for me, that's, that's the movie. And – uh, I watched a thing uh, about it, like a behind the scenes thing, a documentary. I can't remember which one, but it was that Spielberg shot the film. Like he put the camera position at about four feet uh, or three and a half feet, four feet, which is the level of where you, how you would see things as a kid. Cause right. you would, you would only be that tall. And they, they were saying that's why this film's impactful because most of the film is kind of shot through the, uh, the not only the, 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 perce- the, 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 the perspective of, of ET, but the perspective of Elliot as well. And I was yeah. just like, Oh my God, that's probably why I love it so much. Right. So. Yeah. And he shot in chronological order. And when I started making movies, I would shoot in chronological order just because I thought that's how you made movies. And as I got yeah. older, no, you don't make movies <laughs> that way. But thinking back in ET, how effective was that for the act, the child actors, because they meet, et and they're in awe and when they say goodbye to him at the end they're crying their eyes out because they were really saying goodbye to et because he shot it that way it's brilliant wow amazing yeah. uh, steven spielberg um a god amongst men have you seen uh, what, well i went to see uh west side story twice i love west side story i, think I haven't seen it yet beautiful. um yeah uh i'll probably and i'm not a big musical guy oh with yeah. the exception of uh willy wonka and uh <laughs> team america but um <laughs> but i do i do appreciate i appreciate musicals they're just yeah. but, but i'll check it out because it's spielberg it's it's, yeah, so it's okay so um like i said rapid not not very rapid fire but next question all right so tell us some more uh you've talked over the years about the ghosts that allegedly haunt the mayfair theater i say allegedly because i don't want to get sued by any sort of paranormal uh legal service so can you quickly tell us one of those stories well the, yeah we've had two different uh, organizations come in, paranormal investigators, and they both determined that there are two ghosts behind the screen and one ghost at the back of the theater sitting in one of the couches who really doesn't like when people sit with him. I understand the one in the cinema is a him, and I think it's a man and a woman behind the screen. So there's three in the cinema. I've not seen anything that made me believe that, but this organization, one of them had recorded something behind the screen that determined all this. Uh, and I like looking for, when I was a kid, I wanted to believe in ghosts more than anything. I love close encounters of the third kind as a kid so much because I could tell Steven Spielberg wanted to believe in UFOs as much as I did. And I was just, I want, I always looked up to see something and I always at night wanted to believe in these things. And I've not really ever seen anything that make me believe in ghosts or UFOs. Uh, I hope, I hope someday I, I meet these people who are haunting the Mayfair theater. (laughs) <laughs> anything happen if you sit in the couch like has anyone said anything after they've sat in the couch with the no with the no not not any people i think the movies are the programming so good at the mayfair people are just watching the movies right. <laughs> Maybe, well, that'll be me as a ghost i don't like people sit i don't like strangers sitting next yeah, to me during a movie anyway <laughs> the, the, the hand yeah no, uh, I, to be honest no but this these are the stories <laughs> okay so moving on uh rapid fire uh what do you want uh you're programming the ultimate triple bill at the mayfair theater what three oh, films are you oh, picking oh oh i love this question when i retire i'm gonna do the my when i retire my last night i got three films all chosen this th- this is a trilogy to me in my head uh shane the okay. West, followed by uh hud with paul newman and Midnight Cowboy. Okay. I feel that. So I don't know if you're familiar with all the films, but Shane, in Shane, the young boy is played by an actor named Brandon D. Wild. And he looks up to Shane. And when Shane leaves, he's sad to see Shane go away. And then in HUD with Paul Newman, Brandon the Wild has grown up. He's a teenager now. And he plays uh, HUD's younger brother. 
And he kind of, to me, when I watch it, he feels like the boy from Shane. You know, uh, it's a little bit more modern setting than Shane. Right. But it's the kid from Shane. And I know whoever cast Shane cast him because he's in Shane. And at the end of HUD, Brendan Wild leaves the farm with a transistor radio at his ear and he gets on a bus. That's the opening of Midnight Cowboy, played by John Voight, not Brendan Wild this time. Brendan Wild is a blonde haired kid with a cowboy hat on, transistor radio here, and he gets off the bus and he's in New York City. When he checks into his shitty little room that he finds there's a hud poster on the wall ripped in half and that's that's that, that's you know the director of uh midnight cowboy telling me oh yeah this is this is a sequel to hud and wow. sequels a hud sequel is a sequel to shane at one point in my life i thought part four was forrest gump but i'd have to rewatch forrest gump again i can't remember why i thought forrest gump was part 4 but that's it shane hud and midnight cowboy that's a great triple bill okay Fair follow enough. Fran, follow the blonde haired Brandy wild <laughs> <laughs> let us know when that's screening we'll come down and see check okay, it out sure. like all on 35 millimeter i hope Yes, absolutely. I would expect nothing less. Um, I know we've got a bonus question because I thought of it uh, as I was doing my research for the program. Uh, yes, that's right. Even though we go live, we still do research on the show. Uh, but bonus question, I need you to rate this using the five-star classic film rating system. Could you rate your guest appearance on the open mic with Mike Bullard show from all the way back in 2000? Uh, okay. Um, there's two different reviews because have you only seen it on YouTube? Yes. Yeah, I put that up on YouTube years ago. I, <laughs> I cut out one of his questions. I cut out one of his questions because I was embarrassed about my response. So the live, the live telecast, I'd give it one star. But what's on YouTube is five stars. <laughs> so I cut out one stupid thing. I hated how he replied. He was pissing me off all night because he was trying to get my goat. Uh, yeah. Because I because Paul Schaefer didn't show up. Paul Schaefer was supposed to be the first guest. And Paul Schaefer was late getting into the airport. So they put me on first and I just won the spirit of slam dance. And Mike was trying to give me a hard time. And then when Paul Schaefer came on, he was great. Paul was great. But um, yeah, it's embarrassing. I, I like the fact that people still talk about it. <laughs> and uh, my dad met Mike Bullard recently, a few years ago. And Mike remembered me being on too, according to my dad. But anyway, um, I think it's better on YouTube than it was live because <laughs> I tried uh, it. I gave it a Star Wars holiday special, no, a Star Wars special edition treatment. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair enough. And that does it for Rapid Fire. Uh, thanks for being such a good sport uh, about that. Um, and thanks for the insight, too. I really appreciate it. Of course, Rapid Fire is brought to you by uh, Wellington uh, uh, Hellas Lager, Wellington Breweries Hellas Lager. Um, of course, you can pick up uh, tins of, of, the, of your favorite beverage wherever your favorite beverages are sold. And I'll tell you this right now, Hellas Lager is an easy drink drinking lager it's going to be one of your favorite beers for sure so uh big thanks to wellington for sponsoring us and thanks lee for being such a good sport and answering all of our questions for sure uh listen we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back uh if you've got a few more minutes to spare and we're going to talk about how people can actually uh get in touch with you support the mayfair when we can everything kind of comes back online and we're going to talk a little bit about your uh about your new upcoming project your eighth feature film uh you cool to stick around for a few more minutes sure okay right on uh we'll be right back uh right after this Black Fawn Distro. Movies, merchandise. Available now at blackfawndistribution.com. Ha <laughs> 
<laughs> and we're back uh, with uh, Black Font Distro uh, Takeover Tuesday. I'm joined again with uh, uh, um, with my guest uh, Lee Demarb. Uh, Lee, thanks again for sticking around. Uh, that was a uh, quick um, uh, teaser trailer, I guess. I guess not even a trailer, but just a little teaser uh, for your next uh, your eighth feature film uh, called Enter the Drag Dragon. Um, where are you at with that project? What can you tell us about it? That's not that shot's not in the movie. That was just a camera that my one of my cinematographers brought along. We had a little fun after we finished the day. Um, where I, yeah, you know, this movie has been quite the journey. Uh, I felt like I needed to go back to my roots a little bit and make something like I did when we made Jesus Christ Vampire, and not specifically like Jesus Christ Vampire, but make it like Jesus Christ Vampire, where um, I would produce my own independent film you know, shoot on the weekends with friends and just, you know, take our time making a, 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 a and have as much fun as we can making a film. Um, so I started making Enter the Drag Dragon and we had a script that I was really excited about and to share with my cast and crew. So I arranged a, a, a table read at the Mayfair Theater. All the actors and, and crew came to that table read. And a minute before I sat down, I found out that my mother was dying of leukemia. And so uh, that became the first half of the production, me dealing with uh, finding all the free time I had in the world to make this movie and all the free time in the world I had to spend with my mom before she passed. And um, it was actually quite lovely. I spent a lot of time with my mother, spent a lot of time making the movie, and the movie became that for the first half. And then after my mother passed, um, COVID started. So the second part of trying to make this movie was dealing, you know, during the lockdown. And uh, so, um, you know, but, but the film's been a great distraction for a lot of reasons. Uh, and I, I, I often think to myself, you know, as fun as it was making the movie, if I never shown anyone, if no one ever sees this movie, it was still worth making <laughs> because, uh, you know, I went through a lot trying to get it made with everyone involved. Um, I can't wait to show people. I'm really happy with the film. Um, you know, I it's I I I was I was a day away from finishing editing on the weekend last Saturday when my hard drive crashed and I lost all oh, my man. all my stuff. So I'm getting I'm spending some money. Hopefully within the week I can get back to work on it. Um, but I'm almost done, and it's gonna be, it's a it's a Kung Fu action comedy horror musical drag queen adventure shot in Ottawa. <laughs> and, uh, I can't wait. It, it, it feels like it feels like this one feels like from the people who made Jesus Christ Vampire. Into. Does that feel like like a sort of a very like it's like a giant cycle for you? Like it's twenty years later. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And you know, even even stuff with your mom. Obviously, there's that. You know, I I went through that with my with my dad a, a couple of years ago. Um, but like with your mom being so influential and you kind of getting into film and stuff like that, was that, did that sort of come in, out into, or did that, did you put that into the movie? Yeah. Yeah. So my mother played the screaming lesbian in Jesus Christ Vampire. Too. So this one, this one's dedicated to the screaming lesbian, which the movie opens that way. And it might confuse a lot of people, but I, <laughs> I, I got, I, I got to say my mother's passing was a very positive experience. Because for a year, I spent all my time with her. You know, I would go to the hospital and edit and work on the Mayfair at the hospital. And I wish I'd spent more time with my mother before she got sick. But, you know, she took she she didn't die as fast as they thought she would have. And a lot of people told me it's because I spent so much time with her. And it was, that was really nice. And when my mother passed, I didn't, you know, it was I didn't have a meltdown. I just went back to my movie. And mm. so, uh, I, you know, I've always felt as an artist... You know, my movies only reflect the fact that I like movies. You know, you have Atta McGoyan, who has so much to say as a filmmaker. And you have David Cronenberg, who has such a twisted mind. It's incredible to watch his movies and think about what's inside of his mind. I always felt like, you know, I don't really have a lot of things in my life that make me an interesting artist. But for the first time, maybe with this film, you know, you can see a little bit of me in there. Um, right. You know, because I, you know, we went through so much making the movie, uh, and maybe, or maybe you won't, and maybe only I see it. Either way, when I always reflect on the movie, I'll always think of these, you know, amazing things that went on in my life during trying to get it made. It's not even done yet. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen? I mean, uh, I have six more shots to film to get into the, you know, the, the finish the film. I'm almost done editing. We got to start on the score next. 
color correction, sound mixing, you know, it's nice not being in a rush to finish a movie. And also I don't want to release a movie now during the pandemic. I'd rather wait till things are more open. Um, you know, the, after the first time I see a movie in a sold out theater, maybe then it's time to, to show our film. Uh, yeah. And, 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 you know, please let us know when that's happening too. Cause I oh, think, yeah. uh, I think at that point, I think we're, we're going to be right on schedule to make a big road trip to Ottawa and have some fun in that city. Uh, love Ottawa and love coming to the Mayfair for sure. Um, and I just, uh, you know what, I just wanted to follow up with a couple of comments uh, coming in from our audience, um, is just uh, a quick, quick question from Daryl Ayers. I mean, I think I can uh, answer this, but your theater sounds awesome. Are you mainly screening, especially screenings or do you run new releases as well? You do run new releases, correct? Mostly, Still, mostly yeah. showing new, independent, new foreign language, new national, you know, new Canadian movies, documentaries. Yeah, mostly all new movies. But um, you know, we, we especially after the pandemic, after certain lockdowns, we're be getting bigger crowds for cult classics and horrors. So you know, the the week we closed, we were showing Deliverance. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, and we showed space balls yeah. and deliverance the day we, the week we closed. Like as a double feature? No, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but you can see them both together in one same week. Double features don't work anymore. We can't afford I took over a failed business, so we had to get rid of the uh, double bills. But uh mostly new movies, but uh you know, it is for your fun to see movies you love on the big screen again. Okay. And uh, just, this is actually a very particular uh, 35 millimeter question, which is why I wanted to bring it up. But John's just piping in here, just saying, I'm a private 35 millimeter film collector. I run a, I run a Kinotone FP20. Uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, but uh, does your theater still run film? And I yep. think I know the answer to this too. But uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit about that, I think we yeah. just showed a 35 millimeter print of uh, Unforgiven, Clint Eastwood film. Oh, wow. And I, I like introducing movies on 35. And br I always bring up the last reel say this is what we're watching tonight a lot of people don't really, you might not even care realize what we're watching tonight but we're watching film and i try to make people appreciate it the fact that this is a positive from the negative that was in the camera on set when Clint Eastwood made the movie and it's also threatening to say i gotta stop talking and bring the print back up to the projector so we can finish watching the movie but uh yeah we're still you know and i also th say you know if i brought unforgiven to any other theater in ottawa any Cineplex theater lab, they wouldn't know what to do with it. You know, right. this, this is the only cinema in Ottawa where you can watch 35 millimeter. And we try to bring in prints as much as we can. Um, and it, it's great to show 35 millimeter and it does, especially older films. I mean, anything that was shot on 35 looks great. Yeah. I have a, I have a 35 millimeter print of attack of the clones. I don't know why, because it was shot digitally. <laughs> yeah. It was shot. At, yeah. That's a film that was shot at 2k. Because yeah. At the time, Lucas thought that that was going to be like, that's that was it and so the the only resolution you can any any 4k you buy is an upscale yeah. uh, so that film can never be that can never be mastered at more than 2k it's uh, um but i uh, saw the world premiere of that movie at the Cannes film festival and i went to the first screening and i remember when it showed in toronto on dcp i drove to toronto to see the first dcp screening now I drive to Toronto to see movies on 16 mil, uh, sorry, 35 millimeter or, or being presented on 70 millimeter. But I can't remember. I can't imagine. It's crazy to think that I drove to Toronto to see a film projected digitally. And I remember thinking it was too saturated, but now they've, they've made it better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there, is there a 35 millimeter print um, that, that you have at the Mayfair or, or that you've seen before that would like, just to get people to say, Hey, if you're going to come out and check a 35 millimeter film out, this is, this is one to really start with. And it'll actually kind of, it, 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 you'll, you'll get the difference. Is there, is there a title? We, that comes showed, we showed space balls and my 35 millimeter print of space balls at the time was the print that Mel Brooks showed the studio before he had a final cut. So it had scenes in the movie that aren't on home video. that are not on D any DVD release or any Blu-ray. It had extra comedy in it. So that was really cool. We showed a 35 millimeter print of John Woo's Bullet in the Head from Hong Kong that awesome. never got released theatrically in, in North America. It w Miramax had bought the rights and they dubbed it in English, but decided never to release it. And the only 35 millimeter print that was made in the world was sold on eBay by some jerk over at uh, the Weinstein Company. I, I can't imagine the Weinstein Company hiring jerks, <laughs> but they sold it on <laughs> eBay and it was purchased by someone I know. And we showed this print that never screened anywhere in the world. And that was thrilling. The, the Mayfair was the only one to ever screen it. 
Um, so yeah, you know, I remember we, I remember Concordia University. We screened up before Apocalypse Now Redux came out. We screened a 16 millimeter print of Apocalypse Now, and I was sitting there watching it, seeing Apocalypse Now a million times in my life. Now I remember before Redux, and the movie ended not with by fading to black and just stopping. It ended with the Kurtz compound being blowing up. So you actually saw the airstrike and the whole really? blew up. And I remember seeing a documentary where Victoria Scarosa, the guy who shot the film, never seen that footage. And we screened this. Concordia has the 60 millimeter print. It's, it's amazing. That's my, that's my favorite movie of all time. Yeah, it, 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 that's a very good film yeah. to choose. Yeah. You know, I would take you very seriously after you, 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 if I just met you and you told me that I would take you serious. It was, it was one, it was the one film I remember watching and, and, when I was a teenager and it was like, I was really into film, I was getting into film watching, you know, all the, all the, all the staples that you mentioned too. Like you got to watch this movie and this movie to be taken seriously. And I wasn't doing it other than the fact that I was, had a list and I was like, I should watch these movies to know kind of, you know, whatever. And it was the first movie I was on a big doors kick too. Like every dude is in, in high school. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so I watched that movie and it was like the first movie that I realized like everything had been put together like the cinematography, the soundtrack, the yeah. acting, the story, the adaptation from Heart of Darkness, which is brilliant. And it was the only movie I, I, or the first movie at least, where after the movie was over, I just sat there and thought, I watched all the credits and then, and yeah. then like the, the DVD player, or, or sorry, that it would have been VHS at the time, uh, the VCR stopped and, <laughs> and spit out the tape. And I just remember sitting there still watching, looking at the screen because I had never seen anything that was like that intense or that well yeah. made. It, it's a, a lot of people say it's a hypnotic movie and, and I, would, yeah. I would agree with that. So anyway, uh, listen, I think <laughs> that sound means that time's running out. Uh, <laughs> I'll give, I'll give the wheel a final spin. Val's worth uh, nothing. Content's worth one more comment. Uh, I just want to throw this on. Uh, John's just uh, commented again saying, uh, thank you for keeping film alive. So, Oh yes. Well, thanks. Thanks for knowing that there's a difference between film and video. Yeah. <laughs> like this whole transition happened and no one talked about it. Like we switched, the industry switched from film to digital. We threw out film. The, the, the studios in, in, in the, the warehouses that were storing film in North America destroyed 35 millimeter prints on bandsaws. They took them off the reel and split them and destroyed them, put them in landfills. And no one talked about it. You know, yeah. it's like switching from new coke to back to coke classic the world talked about it but when it came to celluloid something the way we watch movies for a hundred years changed and no one noticed or said anything and it's sad and i'm glad people um i want people to notice and think about it you know it's like it's like google you can go online you can go to google and you can type in the mona lisa and you can look at the mona lisa on, on your laptop or you can go to the louvre and see the mona lisa for real and seeing a 35 millimeter print of a movie at the Mayfair, wherever you see a celluloid print, it's like being at the Louvre. That's what I'd like to tell people. Awesome. To me, it's like that. <laughs> so Spaceball is 35 millimeter. If you see that, if you see that screening at the Mayfair, um, go and check it out. Uh, listen, before we let you go, um, thanks again for doing all this. Uh, I, I know we're in a, in a weird time. I know it's hard for, uh, you know, independent theaters. Uh, it has been hard over the last two years. Um, what is a way, can you, can you just tell our audience, like what's a way where people can support maybe the Mayfair itself or just their independent cinema uh, in general that's located in their community? Like what can people do to sort of support um, uh, owners and programmers uh, during this time? Stop watching Netflix. <laughs> Entirely? <laughs> Cut your... No, but everyone's so comfortable now over the pandemic. Everyone got so comfortable with Disney Plus and, and Netflix. And I just want people to remember the best way to watch a movie is, is in a cinema. And it's not because the screen is bigger. It's not, well, not only because the screen is bigger. It's not only because of the sound. Like I have 7.2 surround sound in my basement. I have a big four skate TV, but seeing movies in the theater is still better because you, there's a communal aspect you can never get at home. You, you, I remember seeing movies like Apocalypse Now for the first time in a cinema or, or Airplane. I remember seeing Airplane as a kid. And I still remember when I watched the movie today, I still remember what, what the audience was like around me reacting. And you don't have to see a movie with someone you know. You can go by yourself and experience a movie with people. Whether they hate it or love it, it's an experience. And you can't get that on Netflix. You can't get it on Disney+. Plus. You can't get that with your 4K TV and your 7.2 surround sound. Cinemas, are, you know, cinema is the seventh art. And please try to respect that by seeing movies as much as you can in the movie theater. 
And, and you know what? We, you know, it, it'd be sad the day we talk about movie theaters the way we talked about video stores. You know, you know, it, it'd be that'll be a sad day, and I hope I never live to see it. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and and surely you're serious too, right? So, yes. uh, just a little airplane reference there for anyone in the know. It's <laughs> my favorite. It's my, fa- <laughs> it's my favorite joke. It's my favorite joke. My mom took us um, to the theater. Uh, listen, Lee. Uh, thanks again for uh, uh, for joining and 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 coming on the program. Uh, we really do appreciate everything you do, especially uh, for us. You, you screen a couple of our films. Uh, I wanted to kind of throw up uh, just a couple of uh, um, quick uh, quick photos as well, just so people realize that we're telling the truth. Uh, but you did screen Disco Path. Uh, there it is on the marquee uh, on the Mayfair uh, when we screened that movie, uh, directed by. Uh, by Ron, our good friend Ronnie, uh, Renaud Gauthier, and uh, of course, uh, I'll take your dad, um, Chad Archibald's uh, um, um, sort of crime uh, crime ghost story uh, there at nine thirty on the Mayfair marquee as well. Um, but uh, just wanted to throw those up as a little bit of a yeah. little bit of a flashback. Um, thanks again uh, for doing this. Uh, of course, um, uh, you know, and, and thanks everyone for tuning in. I think you, you, this is great. This is awesome. I know you're a great storyteller, uh, both in film as well as in person. So appreciate you in the program. Of course, uh, that concludes another episode of Takeover Tuesday. Um, at least stick around just after we just go off the air, just so we can chat just for a couple seconds. Um, but uh, yeah, we're broadcasting live to Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, of course, you can also catch one of our retransmissions on any of the major streaming podcast platforms, including Apple and Spotify. Uh, whatever p- uh, platform you're tuning in on today, uh, please remember to like, follow, share, and subscribe. And of course, make sure you follow Lee on Instagram as well as the Mayfair on Instagram as well. Uh, you can uh, His handle is Lee underscore DeMarb and uh, the Mayfair is at uh, Mayfair Theater. Uh, and, if, and again, if you want to check out uh, Lee's filmography, all the stuff he's worked on, his upcoming projects, uh, make sure you just just pop his name into YouTube. Check out that channel. Make sure you subscribe to that channel as well, and you'll get the updates on uh, all the new cool th- stuff that he's coming out with, uh, including um uh sorry enter the drag dragon <laughs> oh, that's a good <laughs> which one. is what kind of genre again? Because I'm not going to say that. It's a kung kung fu action comedy horror musical. Yeah, about- perfect. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, thanks everyone for, for tuning in. And, uh, again, Lee, thanks again for, for, uh, for visiting. Uh, we hope to see you soon and, uh, all the best, uh, in 2022. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. Take care. Bye. And that does it for another episode of Black Font Distro's Takeover Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, please remember to like, follow, share, and subscribe and help us spread the word about the program and our incredible guests. If you're interested in grabbing some more information about Black Font Distribution or want to check out our film titles and merchandise, you can find us online at blackfontdistribution.com. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, Wellington Breweries Hellas Lager, Deadly Grounds Coffee, Twisted Teas, and of course, Black Font Distribution. Just a reminder, you can always catch Black Font Distro's Takeover Tuesday live on Facebook, YouTube, and our other social media platforms. Or pick up one of our retransmissions on any of the major streaming platforms. Until next time, I'm your host, Benner, from Black Font Distro, and we'll see you soon.